Let's do it. God, I don't get it. I want to understand you, your word, how to talk to you. What am I supposed to be doing with my life? Welcome to Shay L. Askew Ministries, where we dive into biblical teachings in a way that's relatable, fun, and totally down to earth. Greetings to all those who are open to hearing and receiving God's message and seeking transformation in your life through your obedience to God's word. Today's lesson is part one of a three-part series titled Living Guilt Free. Part one will deal with guilt, part two will deal with shame, and then part three will deal with being forgiven, right? And today I just want to deal with guilt. I want to talk about um, the type of guilt that causes you to sabotage your present as well as your future. Um, you know, the type of guilt where things are going really good. Maybe you got some money that you didn't work for. Maybe things in your relationship are going so well that it's too good to be true. Um, maybe you've taken some time to work on your credit or get your finances in order, but then you do something to make it go all the way back to square one right? Sometimes there are some good things happening and we will sabotage and not even knowing that this is an intentional type of sabotage. Listen, guilt shows up in many ways and it can bind you up. And I want us to all feel free and to live in our truth, right? So let's first define guilt. Guilt is an emotional experience that comes up when a person believes that they have violated a um, moral standard or committed some kind of wrongdoing. And when guilt uh, comes, uh, or with guilt comes a feeling of remorse, regret, or um, self-blame. Guilt can lead to negative emotions and psychological consequences, such as having anxiety or depression. Now, we can't talk about guilt without talking about conviction um, because they're very different. Um, while guilt is about feeling bad for doing something you perceived as wrong, conviction is more about feeling accountable to God. We begin to experience conviction when our hearts are grieved, not solely because we might lose our job or lose our spouse or lose whatever, but because we have broken fellowship with God. Second Corinthians, the seventh um, chapter, verse 10 says, godly sorrow brings repentance, worldly sorrow brings death. Conviction is about awareness and the beauty of awareness is that it is the first step towards growth and change. When we think about uh, condemnation, it has guilt and punishment attached to it. There's no wiggle room, right? There's no space to grow and to change. There are only consequences of your actions. Now, there is a such thing as having false guilt, and false guilt is based on self-condemning feelings that you have not lived up to your own expectation or those of someone else. That's what false guilt is. Um, false guilt is based on lies rather than the truth. Um, the enemy strategy is to um, get you to focus on his web of lies so that you will stay having false guilt. And how does he do that? Well, he does this by one, bringing up the past. Mm -hmm. Two, making you feel acceptable by God. Three, reminding you of your failures. And four, making you feel unforgiven by God. Those are the things that he do, right? And here it is, folks. Anytime we find ourselves focused on our past, on our failures and not being accepted or forgiven by God, we are allowing the enemy's strategies to occupy space in our mind. And I don't know about you, but nobody's living in my mind written free, right? Anytime someone comes along and tries to hold you hostage to your past, hold you hostage to your failures, or insist that they know whether or not you are accepted or forgiven by God, you need to rebuke them and you need to mock them. Rebuke them and mark them. That's right, mark them. Know who those people are, right? Do not accept anything they are offering you, right? They are 
taking their cues from their father and their father is the devil and he is the father of all lies. The Bible tells us in John 8 verses 40, verse 44, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Bless the name of God. Folks, God is our father. And he has given us the power to rebuke and resist the devil and his demons. The Bible tells us in Luke 10 and 19, Jesus says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Bless the name of God. You must know your authority, people. And God tells us what our authority is in his word. That's why you got to read it, right? Now, let's go a little deeper and talk about true guilt um, versus false guilt versus conviction, right? True guilt. True guilt is the fact of um, being at fault or committing um, an offense, right? The result of any wrong attitude or action that is contrary to the perfect will of God. That's true guilt. False guilt is rooted in feelings of self-condemnation for failing your own self or failing others' expectations of you. It arises when you blame yourself, even though you've committed no wrong or after having done something wrong, right? You've confessed and you've turned from your sin, but you still feel condemned by it. It is not resolved by confession, because um, as a factual matter, there is nothing to confess because you didn't do anything. Confession won't be effective because false guilt is not based on truth, but rather a lie, right? Um, false guilt keeps you in bondage in, uh, to, to, to three destructive masters, right? Um, uh, shame, which we'll talk about in part two, fear and anger. Those three, those are destructive masters, shame, fear, and anger. Realize that if you continually feel guilty or condemned, the source is Satan. Because God don't want you to walk around feeling condemned all the time. Um, and how do I know this? Because Revelation 12 and 10 tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night. Listen, Satan spread lies to make believers feel eternally guilty by reminding them of their past and uh, their past failures and making them feel unforgiven and unaccepted by God. But Jesus reminds us, as we stated earlier, the scripture says he was a liar, a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, but there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language for he is a liar and the father of lies. And again, that's John 8 and 44. Don't forget that, please. Now, Think about these two kinds of guilt. One is a friend who speaks truth, gently leading you to repentance and forgiveness. The other is a secret conspirator who taunts and condemns bringing dishonor and inner shame, right? Remember, I said rebuke and mock those that want to hold you hostage to your past. Well, the Bible gives us this warning. Be alert. And of a sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's in 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, verse eight. He looks for people to devour. So you got to be alert. You got to be of a sober mind. Ladies and gentlemen, how do we juxtapose true guilt with false guilt, right? What's the contrast between the two? Let's get into it. True guilt is based on facts. False guilt is based on feelings. True guilt says, um, I realized I was wrong to take certain office supplies home for my personal use. I have to admit that um, this is actually stealing. That's a fact. False guilt says, I sure could use those office supplies at home. I feel horrible. I'm horrible for wanting something that isn't mine. That's a feeling, 
It's not a fact. The Bible says if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. You'll find that in James, the fourth chapter, the 17th verse. Bless the name of God. True guilt results in godly sorrow over sin, while false guilt results in a worldly sorrow over consequences. Um, true guilt says my failure to be honest makes me aware of um, how much I don't reflect the character of Christ. I'm truly sorry and sincerely want to change. That's my commitment. That's godly sorrow, people. False guilt says, um, I have confessed that I was dishonest, um, but I, I feel uh, some condemnation or I feel condemned by those around me. That's sorrow over consequences because the people around you are making you feel away, right? The scripture says in 2 Corinthians, verses, uh, the seventh chapter, verses 10 and 11, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourself to be innocent in this matter. Bless the name of God. Folks, simply put, when we know the right thing to do, but we fail to do it, God holds us accountable for not doing it. So it's not only what we do that matters to God, it is also what we fail to do. Because inactivity could be as sinful as overt activity or activity that's done openly. All right, let's go a little bit deeper. True guilt brings conviction. False guilt brings condemnation. True guilt says, I know, I, I, I now see that holding on to my anger towards uh, him or her isn't a solution. I need to confront the situation and admit um, where I've been wronged. That's conviction. False guilt says, I have convinced or I have confessed my um, sin regarding anger. I know God hates the evil that I was doing. Um, I feel like he hates me for um, doing what I did. That is condemnation, right? And we're reminded in scripture that therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's Roman 8 and uh, the first verse. We don't need to feel condemned or walk around with false guilt. Christ died so that we could be free. Bless the name of God. Let's go deeper, right? True guilt results in repentance. False guilt results in retreating. True guilt says, I truly want to be a person of integrity. I promise I'll make restitution and pray for the Lord's strength to change a bad habit. I'm genuinely sorry that I was dishonest. That's repentance, right? You confessed it. You want God to change it. You want to walk in that. False guilt says, I have made restitution and prayed that God would forgive me, but I feel it's hopeless. I can't change. That's you retreating, right? You, you, you're, not, you're not in a repentant state. You are in a retreating state. When you are committed to appropriately responding to true guilt, God's word promises to give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. He says, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You'll find that in Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, verse 26 and 27. Let's go a little bit deeper. True guilt accepts forgiveness. False guilt ex uh, attempts to earn forgiveness. Here's what I want to say to um, this false guilt attempt to earn forgiveness. It is human nature to want to do things to avenge the wrong you have done. That's human nature. But God forgives us. Uh-huh. He forgives us. He does not need you 
to do anything to be forgiven except for ask. You are only required to ask for forgiveness and accept it. That's it. It's that simple. True guilt says, I am thankful that I have a heavenly father who will always forgive me no matter what I have done. That's what his word says. This is a place of acceptance. You've accepted that. But on the contrast, false guilt says, I've asked God to forgive me, but I can't do enough to feel forgiven. That's you attempting to earn forgiveness when God just gives it. All you have to do is ask. The Bible tells us that all the prophets testify about him, meaning Christ, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name, Acts 10 and 43. It's given to us. That's it. You are forgiven and you only need to accept it. There's nothing you can do to earn forgiveness. Christ died so that our sins could be forgiven. That settles every tab. It settles every bill, every whatever. You don't owe anything. Christ paid it all. Bless the name of God. Let's go a little bit deeper. True guilt fo uh, focuses on Christ's work while false guilt focuses on personal good works. You got Christ's works and you got the works that you do that you believe are good. True guilt says only by uh, relying on Jesus Christ to meet my needs, my Jehovah Jireh, um, and on his redeeming work within me, will I be able to be the person I was created to be. It's only only up to God. Like I got to rely on him because of his gift of grace and when we refer to grace, we're talking about God's unconditional love and forgiveness towards humanity, even when it's undeserved. But because of his uh, gift of grace, which he gives to all of us, right? It's my joy to do whatever work God has for me. That points to Christ's work. And this should be the posture of all of us. False guilt says uh, the more God, uh, the more good work um, I do, the better I feel. I'm driven to do everything well so that the good will outweigh the bad. Um, I'm afraid if I don't do enough, I, God is going to reject me. That is all you and it has nothing to do with Christ's work, right? Because the Bible tells us for by grace you have been saved through faith in that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. You'll find that in Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 8 and 9. Lastly, true guilt brings reconciliation with God and others, while false guilt brings rejection from God and others. True guilt says, um, I know God loves me unconditionally, which motivates me to be more loving and forgiving of others. That's reconciliation. False guilt says God could never love me. If others get close enough to see what I am really like, they'll reject me also. That's rejection. That's not reconciliation. Reconciliation with God and others is highlighted in Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verse 3. It says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. God draws us with kindness, an unfailing love, and with kindness. God does not reject us, even if people do. It, it doesn't matter what we do. God will not reject us. And when we know we have stepped out of God's will, true guilt will bring us to conviction. And that will bring us into reconciliation with God. Bless the name of God. In a nutshell... True guilt shows us where we have gotten off um, or gotten out of God's will and where we need to change. It is the uh, right reaction to the realities of our actions when we have indeed committed a sin. True guilt motivates, it pushes us, it probes us to be all that God created us to be. It is healthy and it is helpful. True guilt. By contrast, False guilt, uh, false guilt reminds us of our shortcomings and it undermines our spiritual growth. It leads to disappointment, discouragement, depression, and despair. It immobilizes us when we should be moving forward. 
Jesus. It hinders our development. It stunts our growth. It restricts our freedom. It weighs us down and it keeps us from becoming the person God wants us to be. Bless the name of God. Ladies and gentlemen, knowing the difference between true guilt and false guilt is critical if you desire to walk in freedom. And we all want to walk in freedom. I believe that. We all want to be free from feeling guilt, false guilt, condemnation, all those things. But here's the last thing I want you to know. Ecclesiastes 7 and 20 reads, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who uh, does what is right and never sins. This means that we all fall short and we all make mistakes. No one is perfect. Not me, not you, not no one but Jesus. So what is God's thoughts concerning guilt? Um, these are six things um, that... Uh, we can learn about how God feels concerning guilt. First thing, guilt-free or guilt-ridden consciousness um, are given by God to persuade us that we are obeying or violating his will. Second, guilt is universal. It is a condition we all share, but God forgives and purifies those who confess their sins to him. Three, Guilt left unconfessed and unforgiven brings painful consequences that God uses to discipline us. The Bible says, if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. And that's Matthew 6, um, verse 15. And many people ask, well, how many times do I need to be forgiven people? Well, the scripture tells us 70 times 7. And if you multiply 70 times 7, that is 490 times. Now, surely... No one will commit 490 offenses, I don't think. But if they commit 489 against you, you are required to forgive them. Just as God forgave you. That's the Bible, folks. That's not me. The other thing I want you to know concerning God's thoughts about guilt is, number four, guilt concealed is harmful. But guilt confessed is met with mercy. And that's where we want to be. You confess it to God. Number five. Guilt can be cleansed only through the sacrificial death of Christ. And he did that. That's what he did for us, folks, for our sins. He did it for our sins so that we could live free and not with guilt. And the last thing is guilt that is cleansed by God allows us to draw closer to him. And that's where we want to be in the hands and the arms of God. Ladies and gentlemen, true guilt is real and it's based on facts. False guilt is fake and it is based on feelings, which is consistently influenced and constantly changing. Our parting scripture, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's John the 8th chapter and the 32nd verse. To all those who are open to hearing and receiving God's word and seeking transformation in your life through your obedience to his word. Until next time.